some people. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. Everybody happy and healthy. We're back in the book of Luke today, looking at the teachings of Jesus and something that will be very familiar to you, which is what you might know as the Lord's Prayer. How many of you have that memorized? I'm wondering, the Lord's Prayer. Okay, it's great. You'll, you'll just know that it's been um, named incorrectly. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's when the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, and they, he was then instructing them on how to pray. And with all of the things that we do, I think prayer is probably the most mysterious thing that we don't understand what God wants from us. You know, do we need to do it three times a day, morning, noon, and night, five times like the Muslims? Do we need to, uh, should I be on my knees? Should my hands be up? Should I be on my face? Should it, you know, like we, we, I don't know about you, but I, I wonder because they see prayer being done in so many different ways. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there's always the quick prayer. Where it's just like, Jesus, help me, you know? And, and then we're, uh, that, but that, that's not here. So I, I, I wonder if that's acceptable. But I have all these questions, you know, and when we pray, do we change God's mind? Can you take a God who already knows the beginning from the end and change? I mean, it's, it's almost like a science fiction thing. If I go back in time, can I change what would happen in my then future? None of you think these things. Okay, well, does prayer change God's mind or does it change us? It's an interesting concept. So I hope that you'll follow along with me in, uh, in, every, in everything as we go through the book of Luke. But first, pray with me. Father, as we delve into this wonderful work that you have for us, your word, I pray that you help us. Help me specifically, since they're not saying much. And I pray that I might say it well. And that your spirit might work in all of our hearts a new work. Something new and different inside of us, that we might have another understanding as to what you meant when you taught us. Help us now, Lord, in our minds and hearts that we might be singularly given over to your purposes. So Lord, we give you this day, we give you our hearts and our minds and our attention in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're back in chapter Luke, in chapter 11 of Luke. He says to them in chapter two, uh, verse two, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed, be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I've noticed that it's easy for me to go through the entire prayer because I have it memorized, but it's hard for me to pick out one part. Have you ever tried to do that? Like what comes before this? It's, it's like the alphabet. What comes before L? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, G. It's one of those things. <laughs> And see, that's the danger because we have this thing kind of ingrained into our minds. And, you know, it's like, our Father, why are I be You know, you can just raffle it off like, uh, you know, you're, you're at an auction or something. And, or you can just say it like most people do dispassionately. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy. You know, there are ways that we just completely misunderstand what Jesus is trying to say. And yet, this is actually when the disciples asked Jesus, what do we do? How do we pray? Teach us. I think it's an amazing thing. And we turn it into something that Jesus never intended it to be. So let's take a look at the passage and uh, hopefully it will be helpful for us. Just a reminder of what we went through last week, the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus was trying to tell a religious lawyer who was trying to say, hey, listen, we, you know, what do we have to do to, to enter the kingdom of God? What do we have to do to be good enough? And he says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second like, I love your neighbors yourself. So go and do that and you'll live. Except who can do that? No one. That was Jesus' whole point in telling the Good Samaritan. It wasn't that we'd be nicer people. 
It'd be, you can't be nice enough because here's the standard. So go and do that and you'll live. And the lawyer felt a little, unconsci- you know, a little uncomfortable, said, well, well, where's the loophole? Who's my lawyer? I mean, who's my uh, neighbor? He says, well, I'll tell you a story. And he told him about the Good Samaritan. And he says, which one of these three that walked on that road that day was a neighbor to the one who fell? And he couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said, the man who stopped and helped. (laughs) And he says, you're right. Go and do that. Which means anyone that you come across that has a need, you need to just drop your entire life and drop a bunch of money and time and effort and attention and love and compassion and invest in them, no matter who it is. You go do that and you'll live. How many of you do that on a regular basis? No one. No one does. And that's the whole point of the Good Samaritan. You can't be good enough. And so here's one guy that stopped and did the work and Jesus commended him for being a good neighbor. And then the next incident, you have Mary and Martha and Martha is serving and she's, you know, she's doing it, man. She's making sure everybody's fed and you have 12 disciples over your house along with Jesus and the crowds outside, you know, she's a busy lady. You know, get off my lawn. I could see you're doing some of that. Those are my flower beds. You know, I can see that happening. And she was upset because Mary, her sister, was at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach. And she went right up to Jesus, probably stuck her little crooked finger in his face, said, don't you care that my sister has let me to serve? Tell her to get up. Tell her to help me serve. Don't you care? Don't you care? It's interesting. We make such accusations of God sometimes when we go through things. Don't you care? And he says, Martha, Martha, you've been busy about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen the greater part and it will not be taken away from her. In other words, loving the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind first involves loving God. Secondly, involves loving your neighbor. So be careful you don't get too wrapped up in serving your neighbor and you forget to serve God. So that's essentially what we went over last week, so you don't even need to listen to it. (laughs) This week, we're going to look at prayer, which is an interesting topic. I'm just going to read through the first 13 verses, and then we'll go back and take it apart. Now, it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer him from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. But I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So that's a section that talks about prayer. He tells two stories after he explains how to pray, trying to help us get an alignment on how we should see God. So we'll pick it up here from verse one. Now it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, and you could probably guess who that is. It's probably Peter. He was the, the least shy of all of them. <laughs> Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. The question is, how should we address the living God, the king of the universe, the creator of all things? And it's interesting because Jesus' answer is not as you might think. You know, those who are professionals, those who have gone to Bible college and seminary and, you know, have multiple letters after their name, these people should know how to pray. And usually those people have the voice for it too. Oh, holy God, creator of the universe, glorified and lifted up above all things. The one in whom in ages past to put their trust, you know, people can very easily get very loquacious. <laughs> Just came to me. Yeah. Or they put on a special voice or they speak in 1611 language when they pray. None of this is scriptural. And yet the people who are professionals, that's what they should do, right? Right. And so Jesus is going to tell them how to pray. They're asking. This is the only recorded request of the disciples to ever be taught anything. They never asked Jesus to teach them anything else but this. And Jesus taught them. It makes you wonder if you say, hey, Lord, that whole walking on water thing, how do you do that? I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you have some other requests? But you see, they're inspired by Jesus's relationship, by his Amen. conversation, by his touching of heaven through prayer. Jesus is in a certain place and he's praying. And I get the idea that the disciples were done with whatever malarkey it was they were doing and they just show up and Jesus is praying. So they kind of, you know, is he going to be done soon? And they kind of stand there and listen to his prayer. And they're inspired to ask him, how, how do we do that? They were inspired by Jesus as he exemplified intimacy with his father. You see, it wasn't, it wasn't a show. It wasn't hugely verbose, lots of words. It was intimate. And prayer, if anything, needs to be intimate. It's not a performance. And uh, just reading through this has kind of rejuvenated my heart about prayer a little bit. But they were inspired by Jesus to ask, teach us how. And it's not a prayer, it's praying. You know, I have a book in my office that has all sorts of things in it. It's a minister's manual. So like when you go to a funeral, there's a prayer you play at the funeral. You know, there's scriptures that you pull, you know. And if you go to a wedding, there are scriptures that you read at a wedding and there's suggested readings and all this. So that's like a prayer. And the Jews had the very same thing. They would have the Shema. They would be able to pray. Like when you're thanking God for food, you wouldn't want to say the same thing you say at a funeral. That's a prayer. You see, that's like written down, scheduled, note by note. And, you know, let's bow and pray as I read. And then you read a prayer out of a book. So they're not asking for a prayer. They're asking to pray, which is connection. How do I connect with God like you do? That's the question. He's not saying teach us a prayer. Yeah, no problem. If you're in a scrap, this is what you do. Help! There you go. Amen. It's, that's a prayer. But Jesus is teaching them to pray, which means what he's about to tell us is something more than what we've made it into. He's not telling them it needs to be a certain place or they need to be in a certain position or recite this as a platitude, as some kind of a trite thing. You know, like when, 
when somebody dies and, and they're weeping, you say, they're in a better place, which never helps anybody, just so you know. It might make you feel better because you have something to say when you feel like you should say something. Peter did that a lot. He said things because he didn't know what to say, so he just said things. It doesn't usually work. That's a platitude. He didn't say you should pray this on certain occasions, like only on Sunday or three times a day, you need to be on a schedule, or five times a day like the Muslims, or, you know, he didn't say that. He just said, when you pray, and he explained what your prayer should contain, it's a map, it's a model, it's a footprint. And I think it's wise for us to learn it that way. So please don't legalize it. In other words, I say at morning, noon, and night, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, my kingdom come, thy will. Do you know what you're saying? I remember in the past when I used to listen to the radio, I listened to the radio and a good song would come on that I recognized and I'd start singing and I'd go, oh my goodness, what am I singing? <laughs> it feels like my body and you think I'm sexy. Huh? <laughs> and I'm singing to myself in the car, which is a little weird. You see, we just kind of engage and just take off. And praying to God should never be that. It should never be just words. Just like worship this morning isn't just words. And that's kind of the, the hard thing about being familiar with the Lord's Prayer. We make it into this sort of a, you know, what time is it? In the middle of saying, speaking to God, supposedly praying. And it's not like that. So... Don't legalize it because you'll ruin it and you'll gut the content of it and there'll be no more intimacy. It won't be communion with God. It'll just be you reciting, you know, hickory dickory dock. So Matthew chapter six, verse seven, Jesus said this, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So there are two things that Jesus warns about in our prayer. Number one, that you don't say the same thing with no meaning. Vain, which means empty, repetitions. And the, the Jews used to do it all the time, and they still do. And, you know, if you, if you do a rosary or something of that nature, it's built on saying the same thing over and over and over, and thinking you'll be heard because of your many words. Actually, the, the rabbis wrote that um, a righteous man prays with many words, and God hears him. It's actually written. It's in the Talmud. Anyway, Jesus said, don't do that. Don't think that you're going to say these vain repetitions. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't repeat something. In fact, he's going to tell us in a little bit we should continue to repeat, but not vainly. And number two, make sure that you don't think that you're going to nag God into hearing you. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been nagged? Wow, no hearty amens at all. Okay. <laughs> Nagging is when somebody is putting the pressure on you verbally to do something that they wish you to do, but you, for whatever reason, are unwilling to do it. And they believe that pressuring you with more words or maybe making it louder or slower, or enunciated. Oh, listen, I, I'm sorry. Perhaps I'm reliving a trauma. <laughs> Jesus said, don't use vain repetitions. Don't think you're going to be heard by God because of your many words. All right, all right, all right, I'll do it. Dave, just stop. Just don't say another word. I don't want to hear your voice. Jesus said, don't do that because that's not the way he is. That's not the way God is. He doesn't listen because you put the pressure on him, and, and trust me, he knows what manipulation is far, far away. Don't do it. Verse 2. We're flying at light speed here today. <laughs> so, he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's the first half. Maybe you have this one memorized. It's in Matthew. In this manner, therefore, pray. By the way, this was at a different time. 
This is when he was in Galilee, and this one that we're looking at is not. So these are two separate occurrences where Jesus teaches to pray. And you'll notice they're slightly different, which tells me it's not word for word, right? In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. That's a little different. As we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Jesus continues speaking. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. That's kind of like a, a big ta-da. It's like when Netflix comes on. It's a ta-da. It's very dramatic when you think about the fact that contained in this prayer, you're asking God to forgive you in the way that you forgive other people. That's included in the one in Matthew. So if you don't like that, just go to Luke. And, but it won't be any better because it says here, forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone indebted to us. Do you know what, you know what it is to just in prayer lie to God? I mean, I, I forgive every except you know who. <laughs> Can you imagine praying to God and just lying to his face that way? Forgive me because I forgive ever. You better stop yourself. Anyway, you'll notice it's split into two parts. One half is about God and the other half's about us. Just doing a quick view. Half of it's about God and half of it's about us. Like the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So it makes sense it would be broken up in that format, just so that you have a quick overview. It's not long and verbose, uh, wordy. It's not wordy. It's not some big long thing that you have to memorize that's so hard, right? In fact, most of you have it memorized. If you were a good Catholic, they drilled it every Sunday. It's not very long. And this is how Jesus tells us to pray. So in Ecclesiastes, we get a nice little bit of information. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God for God is in heaven and you're on earth. Therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity and a fool's voice is known by his many words. It's an interesting verse, isn't it? Makes you go, hmm, you guys are so well taught. <laughs> For a dream comes through much activity. In other words, the busier and more frantic that you are, the more nightmares you have. And just like the amount of activity will determine how many nightmares you have. So the amount of words will tell everybody what a fool you are. That's, not, that's the Jersey version. So, and he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. By the way, this is prayer. And if you don't know what prayer is, it's communing with God. It's relational and personal. It's not just, you know, throwing something up on the wall. This is not a casual thing. This is communing with God. And so it's give and take, isn't it? Like a conversation on the phone. You don't say, hi, and you hear nothing on the other end. Do you continue to talk? I wonder what happens when we pray and nothing seems to come back. There are reasons for that. Because something should be coming back. It should be give and take. It's, it's communal. It's not sterile, rehearsed, external, or non-emotional, and it is not a magic spell. Have you ever watched movies, you know, when something devastating is happening and somebody goes, our father, we're in heaven, I'll be the one. And they think like they're going to cast away the evil by saying the magic spell over their difficulties. Have you, have you not seen this? People using the Lord's prayer as a magic spell. It's not a magic spell. 
or people saying it unemotionally. Our Father who art in heaven. That, uh, I've seen it done that way for uh, a lot of times. God forgive me. So remember who you're addressing first thing. It's our Father in heaven. It's interesting, it's not my Father. It's our Father. Isn't it interesting? The very first word includes us. So when I pray, I'm praying to our Father. When you pray, you're praying to our Father. You know, we probably wouldn't trip over a bunch of stuff if we remembered that. I go through the, the list of things that I pray and, and how I pray, and it's sometimes very focused on me. He says, begin with our. Our Father. It means that the prayer is shared. It's not me or I, but we. And Father, it's interesting, to the Jewish mind, now Jesus is teaching his Jewish disciples, this is like almost blasphemy. Calling God your Father, and the word that Jesus used is Abba which means daddy. So when you pray, say, our daddy. That seems like irreverent, doesn't it? Except Jesus says that's how we should pray. If you, if you go to Israel, you'll see little children chasing their father saying, Abba, Abba. And that's what they call him instead of Dada or daddy or pop up or, you know, daddy. Make sure you address your father as daddy. I'm already uncomfortable. <laughs> Who's in heaven? It's the region above the... the Sidereal. <laughs> heavens. In other words, beyond our universe, our planets and so forth. In the heavens, the seat and the order of things eternal and consummately perfect where God dwells with other heavenly beings. So you're addressing our daddy who resides in heaven beyond all of the planets and the sky and space. That's a big deal. It certainly is different when you think about it instead of our father and mutter it. Hallowed be your name. Uh, names don't have the significance that they once did. In fact, you name your kid because, I don't know, what are the names in 2022 that they'll be naming children? And you kind of pick one of those. That sounds nice. has a nice sound to it. But names were usually picked because of their meaning. You know, you don't just say, I don't know, we're having a boy. What do you name him? I don't know. Just let's call him John. That's easy. All right, Jonathan. We'll call him Jonathan. Which actually means gift of God. It'd be different if you named him gift of God. That'd be pretty interesting in kindergarten. <laughs> Gift of God. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have a choice in my name. Hallowed be your name. It's God's holy identity that's attached to his name. You know, when somebody mentions your name, like Jonathan, it comes up with a whole list in your mind of characteristics, right? You know, you know what he looks like. You know what he sounds like. You know how tall he is. All of these things that we understand are all attached to that name. And so when praying in the name of Jesus or hallowed be your name, it's his identity. It's everything that's attached to his name. Make sense? Yes. Just yes. thank you. I can move on. <laughs> your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. First of all, you want to remember what you're doing. When you're praying, you need to remember what you're doing. How many of you start to pray and go, oh, a shiny thing? <laughs> or you get, you get on your knees and you get comfortable on the couch. You put your face in your hands and you go. <laughs> People say, you know, I have trouble falling asleep at night. You're not praying. I know you're not praying. <laughs> the devil will rock you right to sleep. You need to remember what you're doing. Your kingdom come. You guys are on mission, by the way. And it's about bringing God's kingdom to the earth. So remember what you're doing. 
It's about his kingdom. It's about his will. Notice it's not about you. Amen. It's, hey, God, I got a problem. Really? I could see him saying, yeah, this thing going on. I, I, my presidential candidate didn't win. I'm unhappy about that. I could see God looking down and say, wow, it sucks to be you. <laughs> Didn't you think I was in control? Didn't you think that uh, I'm allowing this for a particular reason? <laughs> kind of didn't think about that. And sometimes we don't understand what we say when we say it, and this is a really good gauge to kind of match ourselves. Are you praying about God's kingdom? Or are you praying about his will? It's prayer. It's about bringing heaven to earth. It's not about, it's not about complaining about stuff down here to heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. And guess who he's going to use? The person who prays. It's about bringing heaven to earth because he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're his representatives, we're his kids, we're his emissaries bringing about his will until he comes. In prayer, we become partners. It's not like we're twisting God's arm to do something. We want to know, hey, what, it is, what is it that you're doing? And what should I pray about? And how do you want me to pray about it? Because it's about your kingdom here until your kingdom comes. It begins with a surrender to his will and my willingness to shine his image to the world. Because if I want what's going on in heaven to be on earth, I need to be the person that begins with right? The world picks up on things like this. I mean, even Michael Jackson, you know, the man in the mirror thing, it, it's going to begin here. And so in prayer, as we're asking God to change things, we're also volunteering to be that change. As in heaven, I pray that it would be on earth. And sure, he's going to do things here if you pray about it, but he's going to start here and then you're going to be the spark that influences people. So it's a very different thing. And you want to make sure when you're praying that you stay on target. Stay on target. Stay on target. Don't get distracted. Verse 3. Give us this day our daily bread. Oh, by the way, suddenly our needs are being addressed. Notice the first half was all about God, recognizing who you're talking to and what your mission is and what he's doing. And it's about what he wants, his will. And then suddenly, by the way, I've got a need. <laughs> Any of you have needs? Yes. All right. Just one. Okay, that's great. All right, just Rocco. Okay. Give us this day our daily bread. This is a petition for provision. It's asking God to provide for our needs, which is very understandable. But if that's all that your prayer life is, you're missing a whole bunch of things and recognizing who you're talking to and what God has called you to and what we're supposed to be doing. Because God truly does care about our daily needs and he desires to be involved in the minutia, the little things in our lives and our needs. God wants to be involved in your needs. In fact, the very fact that you have a need might be his way of getting your attention. I'm hoping he doesn't have to break your leg to get your attention. I'm hoping he doesn't have to give you some crazy disease so you're flat on your back like he's done to me. I'm telling you, there are times when I get sick and I'm like, God, why am I sick? And he goes, it's the only way I can get your attention. I'm just trying to be honest. Sometimes there are things going on and we don't know why they're happening. Sometimes there are difficult things that are happening in our lives. I think the Lord's trying to tap us on the shoulder and get our attention. It's like 9-11. You remember when 9-11 happened? Everybody had the signs out, pray for our troops, pray for our country, God bless America. Everybody was, you know, the churches were packed until it wore off. Everybody went back to who they really, really were. Sometimes it's the only way you can get our attention. Yeah, I'm going to pray for my daily bread and a Lamborghini. So does this prayer leave room for me to pray for a Lamborghini? After all, I need one. 
No comment. I don't know. How about no? There are people that pray for riches and income and wealth and influence and power. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a very different thing, isn't it? So doesn't that kind of limit us from praying about all these, you know, I need a new jet sort of things? Don't do it. Just. <laughs> Verse 4, and forgive us our sins. You see, we're talking about our daily needs, and now we're going to talk about our other daily need, our need for forgiveness. How many of you have a need for forgiveness? How about just from this morning? <laughs> forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Forgiveness. This is us asking God to give us humility. Because to confess that you're a sinner and that you need forgiveness takes a great deal of humility. You have to look at yourself very honestly and say, I fall short and I don't do everything God wants me to do. I certainly don't act like the Good Samaritan to everybody I see. You know, there are some people that, that call me on the phone and I go, oh boy. <laughs> I, just, I just walked around. Sometimes it's because I don't have time for an hour and a half conversation with maybe you. <laughs> maybe I'm in the middle of taking care of something else, like a two-year-old, which is hard to have an in-depth conversation when you're distracted. Forgiveness. It's asking God to do this, but it's also saying, forgive me like I forgive others. Forgive me like you know I've forgiven everybody else, right? And we need to do this because if we have sin in our heart, God's not going to hear our prayer. It says here in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear if I'm going to pray to God and I got something in, you know, hey, God, I'm going to come to you and ask you for things and ask you to forgive me of my sin. And he goes, well, you're kind of wearing one right now, aren't you? Well, yeah, but that's like my pet sin. You know, all the others, I'm good with everything else, but except this person that you know I'm really bad at because of what they did. And you know what they did. He goes, yeah, I know what they did. You want me to forgive you? Well, yeah, but I didn't do anything like this guy did. Well, you got to let go of that. What? Yeah, you got to let go of that. You got to give that to me. I'll take care of it. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I need to make them feel worse. Because if I don't make them feel bad, they'll never change. Now, I know you don't have these voices in your head, but I do. <laughs> Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. If you wonder why your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling and God's not listening, God's not changing, you're not changing, the situation's not changing, it might be that you're holding on to something that he wants you to let go of. Let it go. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you don't have 1 John 1, 9 memorized, it's a good one. Because I need to remember that no matter how often I mess up, I can always confess, which means to agree with God, the thing that I've done, and he's faithful. In other words, he'll never leave you hanging or say no. And he's just. In other words, whatever it is you've done, there's a punishment for. And he'll make sure that that punishment is taken care of, but not on you. He's already taken care of it in the person of his son. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. The ones we've done in the past, the ones we've done today, and the ones we haven't even done. 
if you've committed your life to him and accepted him as your savior and Lord and accepted that free sacrifice, your sins are forgiven. He is faithful and just. So it's not like he's, that's okay, you're my kid. Don't worry about it. It's not like that. He's faithful and he's just. There's a punishment, but the punishment is in his son. It's not on you. Amen? Amen. In Matthew 6, which uh, is the other time Jesus teaches about prayer, he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. I don't know about you, but none of you has a long enough list that I'm willing to exchange and say, yeah, I'm going to hold on to this because I think I need to punish them because my list is way longer than anything you've ever done to me before God. That seems like an awesome trade. Drop the rock, let go of this bitterness and this unforgiveness, which is, is like water dripping into the soft stone of your heart that eventually makes a crevice so deep that there is nothing else that you can feel. First Thessalonians 5, 16 and 19 says this, rejoice always. Now, that's a good memory verse because it's only one, it's only two words. <laughs> rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. You ever try that while you're driving? Okay, red light, break. Father, everybody no, no, no. It means pray without ceasing, which means your eyes aren't closed and your hands aren't, you know, folded and your knees aren't bent and you're not on your face or, or on your back or looking up or looking down. You know, you can do that all the time and nobody will think anything of it, even if you're saying it out loud, because people have cell phones now attached to their car and nobody thinks it funny if they go, you. <laughs> nobody will even think twice anymore. But before that period of time, it was considered bizarre. So you can continually pray, which means you're always having conversation with God. Some people call it talking to yourself, but you know what? That's not good because you can get into conversations with yourself and be tied up. Well, what do you mean? I mean, it can lead to mental illness. Like how? <laughs> or you can get in an argument with yourself. Oh, stop it. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're going to do the whole Gollum thing. But you can pray to God and God will answer your prayers and he will speak with you and you can do it at any moment in time. And you can pray right now, say, Father, I pray that he gets off this point because I'm done. Let's move on to the next thing. You can do that. And it says here not to quench the spirit. This is the will of Christ in you. Do not quench the spirit. And so when the spirit of God comes and speaks to your heart and tells you to pray about something, don't say, yeah, I'm too busy. You know, I don't take care of it right then and there. I have people that call me and say, Pastor Dave, would you pray for me? And I say, yeah, let, let's pray right now. And they're like, oh, <laughs> you got a need, right? Yeah. You want me to pray about it? Yeah. Let's do it right now. Oh, you want me to pray with you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, let me, let me dust off the floor. You know, like, Prayer is not as formal as we think it is. And especially if you're always in communion with God, if you're always talking to him and he's speaking back to you and you're living your life in the spirit. I mean, that's, that's a pretty awesome place to be. You know what I'm talking about? But don't quench the spirit. When God touches your heart to do something or to pray about something, do it immediately. Cause you know that that stuff has a shelf life. So do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now this one's always peculiar because you're praying that God won't tempt you. Any of you good Bible scholars have a problem with this? My friend Sean does. Well, in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we're given a little bit more information. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. Well, that kind of runs in the face of what we're supposed to pray. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when of his own desires he is drawn away and enticed. 
So temptation doesn't come from God. So what is it to pray that he lead us not into temptation? You have to understand the nature of the word temptation. The original word is test or temptation. It's the same. The translators of the scriptures have put in what they believe is kind of leading the witness into the direction that it would be appropriate. And here it's lead us not into temptation, trials, difficulties, hardship. What it is, is a confession that I'm weak, God, and you got to protect me. You know what the opposite is? Is that all you got? Little rain? Bring it. You see, that's the opposite of what this is. What this is, is God, please have mercy on me because you know that I'm weak. And if I'm tempted in a certain area, I might just have to smack that guy. I'm trying to tell you what it means. It means, please, Lord, don't put me in a place where I'm going to blow it because I don't want to blow it. I, I want to serve you. I want to do what's right. I want to bring your kingdom to the earth. I want to be a shining uh, example of your image. And I don't want to do wrong. So God, please save me from this temptation because I, don't, I can't deal with it. It's telling him I'm vulnerable. I'm dependent. I need God's strength or I'm going to go back to doing drugs and beating people up and ripping cars off and breaking into houses. And if, if I don't submit my heart to Christ and say, God, I'm, you got to take me the way I am because I'm weak. If you don't admit that you have sins and forgive other people and that you're weak and you need God to protect you, he's going to show you how dependent you really are. And I don't want that. So do not lead us into temptation or trial or difficulty or hardship but deliver us from the evil one. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we're told this, no temptation has overtaken you except as is common to man. In other words, it's not original to you. Everybody has the same temptations. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Which means there is nothing that will come into your life that is not father filtered. But God, you don't understand. I couldn't resist myself. No, he does understand. And he won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but along with the temptation will provide a way of escape so you can stand up under it. So you can't say, I had no choice, I had to do this. Because God is filtering that stuff. So you can't point at him and blame him for you falling into temptation. It's all about what's inside of us. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. And aren't you glad for that? For we do not know how we should pray for, uh, what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You ever gotten to the place where you're just like, Ugh. That's a prayer. That's a prayer. Oh boy. That's a prayer. Because God knows your heart and the spirit of God intercedes and God knows what's going on. Even if you can't put it into words, groanings, not another language, groanings. Ugh. Sometimes it's mumbled. No one would understand it, but God would. <laughs> God knows. All right. Warning. I'm going to go at high speed, but I also want to tell you in the next two passages are sarcastic. Those of you who are susceptible to sarcasm, hurt feelings, indignation, just warning you. No, it's not just my opinion. It's really sarcastic. It's coming. No, I'm not projecting. Just because I'm sarcastic doesn't mean I see sarcasm everywhere. Sarcasm is everywhere. And so I see it. Just figured I'd let you know. The next two passages address two obstacles to our prayer life. And it seems a little out of left field when you read it. But listen. And Jesus said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to him at midnight and say to him, friend? Friend? Lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey at midnight and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, do not trouble me 
the door is now shut. My children are in bed with me. I cannot rise to give to you. By the way, this is normal. Families would sleep all together to conserve heat. I mean, I don't know how else anyone else would be able to stick their cold feet under my thigh. I say to you, though he will not rise to give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Well, I understand that story. I get it. If I'm in bed and somebody comes, if I have a ring on my door, I say, hey, dude, I'm in bed. What do you need? <laughs> or if he calls me on my phone, he's not answering the door. He calls me on the phone. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, what do you need? Listen, my wife's got her feet under my thigh. I, I can't get up. <laughs> They're going to be like ice cubes when I get up. Come on, I, I can't come back to this a second time. You get, the, you get the picture, right? We need to adjust our understanding about our Heavenly Father because sometimes we think he is unwilling like a friend who's in bed who's way too comfortable, we think we can't bother God with stuff to pray about. Hey, God, I got some needs. I know the hour is late. I know it's inconvenient for you, but I need you to do something. He's not going to be like your friend and say, hey, man, you got to go away. I can't get up. But your friend will respond because you're persistent. So is the lesson that if you nag God enough, he'll get up out of bed and do something? Or is it sarcastic? God is not like your friend. God loves you unconditionally. And it's not that he's unwilling. And it's not that he doesn't want to answer your prayer. And it's just that, it's not like he's, well, you know, yesterday you were pretty grumpy. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God rewards diligence, but not like your friend. God has a heart and he is willing. Sometimes I, I had a friend named Eddie and he would pray to God in a very unique way. He'd go, hey God, it's me, Eddie. Remember me? And he would just be like a child. It was the coolest thing to listen to him pray because he communed with God. And I think you got to know that he is, and you know that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And you have to know that he's willing to hear you, and he's willing to answer your prayer. That's the first thing you have to know. If you don't know that, it's words bouncing off a ceiling. Jesus says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds into him who knocks, it will be open. Notice there's a response on our behalf to seek God. Ask, seek, and knock. Asking is prayer. Seeking is, okay, what do you want me to do now, Lord? And then knocking is finding a particular opportunity and saying, well, maybe that's what he wants me to do. You know, when you're looking for a job, you get a resume made, you put it out, you ask God to bless it, and then you start looking around. Maybe you look on the internet, maybe you look in the paper, maybe you talk to your friends, maybe whatever, because you gotta pay your bills. And so you begin seeking. And then eventually, hey, I got a hit, I got an email. They wanna have an interview. Oh, you gotta go knock. If you sit there and wait for God to give you a job, it's not gonna happen. Because he already said, you need to ask, you need to seek, you need to knock. There are things that we need to do. And it's not one time, by the way. He means keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. That's the tense of the original uh, Greek. Keep doing it. Be persistent about it. And if God has led you to do such a thing, don't you think he's going to answer that prayer if he's led you to pray it? Absolutely. We need to add to our prayer perseverance. Sometimes we think, well, I just pray one time and if God doesn't do it. Well, he's, you know, I guess he just, Figured he's not going to do it. Well, what's wrong with my prayer life? James 5, 16, 18 says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
Isn't that interesting? There's a healing that happens as we confess, we agree with God and start telling other people, maybe not everyone, but you tell someone, confess your sins that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. It's interesting. We're given Elijah as an example of perseverance. If you read the story of how he prayed the rain back in, he, he got his head between his knees and got down on the ground and he prayed and he told the servant, hey, go look, on the, go look out and tell me, tell me if it's raining yet. He did it seven times. Don't know how long he was down there, don't know, but he was in the position of giving birth with his head between his knees. He's birthing prayer. Finally, his servant came back. He says, I see a cloud. It's the size of a man's hand. He goes, that's it. It's done. And he knew that his prayer was answered because there was a cloud this big. That's a guy who knew that God existed and that he heard him and he was willing to answer his prayer and he wanted to answer his prayer and he knew his prayer was answered by seeing a little cloud. That's the way our prayer life should be. Jesus throws out another story. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? You see that sarcasm. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We sometimes think of God as our father as being like our earthly father who would pull pranks on you. That he somehow may be unable to give you the thing that you're asking. The first scenario was God's unwilling. He's in bed. He's, you know, he can't be disturbed. Don't trouble him. The other one is unable. He just doesn't have what it takes to be able to provide for your need. Note that both of them involve bread, which is in the prayer previous about filling our needs. No, no Lamborghini, just our needs. And so he says, how much more if you fathers on earth who are evil, how many of you know that? You know, we're evil. The Bible says we're evil. We need help. We need to adjust our understanding about our heavenly father, that he loves us. And that not only is he willing, but he is able to answer our prayers. And sometimes we don't get that straight. Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray and how we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Pour out your heart to God when you pray. Don't hold back and don't think that he's unwilling or that he is unable, because he is both willing and able to answer our prayers. Do our prayers originate from self or do they originate from the spirit of God putting something upon our heart that God already wants to do and he wants you to partner with him? I think it's that. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, we're told, be anxious for nothing. In other words, don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're told not to worry about everything or anything. We're told to pray about everything. And when we do that, the peace of God, by the way, it's not the peace that comes from God. It's the peace that God has. Because he's ultimately in control of all things. That's the peace of God. It's not peace from God. It's the peace that God has. In other words, he doesn't worry about who's president or what's going on with the politics or the shot. Or he, he's affixed on the throne and he's good. When we don't worry about it, we choose not to carry something that Jesus told us not to carry. 
and we pray about everything, prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, and then we'll have the peace of God. You want to fight depression? There it is. Choose not to carry something you're not supposed to carry and give it to the Lord. Because we can get all twisted up because we weren't designed to carry that kind of stuff. Shame is not something we're ever designed to carry. Jesus was perfectly suited for it, and that's what he did when he was on the cross. Jesus said, pray like this. 